I just want to emphasize one thing. Please work on your exam first before you watch the video. Okay, work on the exam, the practice exam. first do not do not watch this video without working on the practice exam questions first hello everybody today I'll be doing an exam review how to take advantage of this exam review and be better prepared for your upcoming exams during the past you might have noticed the real exams covers almost exact the same topics as the practice exams. Although sometimes you might run into the same questions that appears in the in the practice exams, but most of the time you would expect to see the same topics rather than the same questions on the real exam. So for this reason, when you review the practice exams, please study the topics each, uh, the, each question represents. Let's start with question number one. Identify the process that is spontaneous. First, you need to understand a spontaneous process can occur without continuous input of external energy. And in other words, if you leave the starting materials unattended, the process will still go ahead. The first choice, electrolysis, is non-spontaneous. This is because it requires continuous input of electrical energy for electrolysis to happen. For example, when you have uh, water, it will not automatically decompose to a hydrogen and oxygen. But if you have continuous input of electro energy, this can be made spontaneous. So electrolysis, uh, what electrolysis does is to make a non-spontaneous process occur by continuous input of electro energy. For photosynthesis, in this process, you actually uh, make a glucose out of uh, carbon dioxide and the water but this requires continuous input of sunlight for the process to occur which means without that the reaction will not occur automatically the rusting of iron will occur automatically so basically when you uh, leave the iron in the air the rusting process is going to start so C is the correct answer about D, when you leave the bread in the air, okay, it's not going to uh, be browned automatically. Okay. Similarly, an egg will not be fried automatically unless you actually use some heat for this reaction to, uh, to go on. The second question, uh, the second question asks you the first, second, and third law. So basically when you do the review for this question, you should be focused on the first law, second law, and third law of the thermodynamics. So what is the first law of thermodynamics? The first law of thermodynamics is the same as the law of conservation of energy, which is the energy cannot be created or destroyed, or the total energy of the universe stays a constant. That's the first law. Okay. The second law is what is stated over here. The second law tells you for any spontaneous reaction, the entropy of the universe will increase. So this is the second law. So what is the third law? Just for review purpose, I'm going to talk about the third law of thermodynamics as well. The third law of thermodynamics tells you for the, uh, the entropy is zero for any perfect crystals of any substance at zero degree K. So basically, a uh, third law tells you uh, entropy is zero for any substance, okay, any substance at uh, 
zero degree K. Uh, it's a perfect crystals. So basically the third law tells you the zero point for entropy. That's why you can measure entropy. There is no such a thing as a zero uh, law, a zeroth law or the fourth law. Okay. All right. Now let's go on to our qu uh, question number three. Identify the process in which the entropy increases. For the entropy, uh, you need to understand several things. Uh, what is the? What are the factors that controls the magnitude of entropy? You have temperature, volume. You have the molecular size uh, in terms of molar mass, and uh, you have the molecular shape, molecular complexity. All right. So the first thing, uh, you look at the question, the phase transition from gas to solid. Uh, from gas phase to solid phase, the substance become more ordered rather than more disordered. So the entropy in this process will actually decrease. Okay. The phase transition from solid to gas, yes, that's the opposite process. The entropy will actually increase for this process. Uh, C, the phase transition from liquid to solid. So uh, the substance from liquid is uh, having more freedom to move. To a solid, uh, the, the freedom of movement actually uh, decreases. So in this process, entropy actually decreases. When you look at D, a decrease in the number of moles of gas during the chemical reaction. Uh, the gas, remember, uh, entropy for gas phase is greater than that of entropy for liquid phase. Entropy is greater for the entropy for the solid phase. So for this reason, if you generate a less number of moles during the chemical reaction, the entropy will actually decrease. Uh, sometimes entropy decreases, we write it as entropy changes smaller than zero. That's the same. Okay. So of course, so far we already know the correct answer is going to be B. However, we're going to continue with E because it's for teaching purpose. So E, the physical transition from gas to uh, to liquid. So we do know, as we see over here, a gas is going to have a greater uh, entropy than that of a liquid state. So E is also undergoing entropy increase. So for this reason. Uh, B is the correct answer. Number four, identify the process that is endothermic. So for the six different uh, physical changes, all right, you have uh, let's let's do a review over here. You have a solid phase. Okay, you have a liquid phase, and you have a gas phase over here. Okay, if you write the solid at the bottom and liquid in the middle, and a gas. Uh, at the top, so uh, the energy, if you write it this way, okay, write the solid, liquid, gas this way, then the, uh, the energy will actually increase uh, if it's anything arrow going up, for example, solid to liquid, uh, or liquid to gas, or solid to gas, okay. Uh, so when the arrow is going up, that means it's endothermic process because it requires the uh, absorbing heat for that process to happen. And then the opposite, if the arrow is actually going down, if the arrow is going down from uh, gas to liquid or gas to solid or uh, liquid to gas, that would be uh, endo, uh, that would be exothermic. So freezing, freezing is from the liquid phase okay, to solid phase. So this is actually a Exothermic, exothermic. So deposition is from gas to solid di directly. The arrow is going down. So this is exothermic as well. Now condensation. Condensation is gas going to liquid directly. So the arrow is going down as you see over here. So uh, this would be exothermic as well. Vaporization is a liquid to gas, so uh, this is endothermic. All right, so that's why D is the correct answer. 
Let's look at question number five. Which of the following statements is true? Endothermic pro uh, processes are never spontaneous. Uh, so basically what this question is testing you is a spon the spontaneity actually depends on two factors, right? So spontaneity depends on two factors. One is the delta H, one is delta S. Okay, delta H is the enthalpy, delta S is the entropy. So when reaction release energy or delta H is smaller than zero, then uh, this reaction is favored in terms of spontaneity and entropy when it increases or when the system becomes more disorganized, more disordered, then this is a favorite. Okay, right. So basically, uh, if a reaction is exothermic, exothermic, or delta H is smaller than zero, then this is favored in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, spontaneity, but it doesn't mean all uh, spontaneous processes are going to be uh, exothermic because even uh, for some endothermic process, they can also be uh, spontaneous. But it is true that most spontaneous processes are uh, exothermic. So let's look at choice number A. Endothermic processes are never spontaneous. That is, that is wrong because we can actually come up with examples about that, right? Uh, examples, for example, at five degrees C, right? Uh, ice, ice melting. Okay, look at this process. Okay, so we do know when the temperature is above the melting point, ice will melt auto automatically, and this process is endothermic, but it is spontaneous. So A is wrong. Okay, uh, entropy is not a state function, so that's wrong. Uh, in general, chemistry one we already learned a state function means uh, you can calculate the difference just by looking at the final and the initial state. Entropy is a state function. You gotta remember that. So this statement is wrong. C endothermic processes decrease the entropy of the surroundings at constant uh, temperature and the and the pressure. So endothermic process so basically uh, the entropy of the surrounding is actually the negative delta H for the system divided by T. Okay, so basically endothermic process delta H is greater than zero, so the whole thing delta S is, uh, for the surrounding will be smaller than zero. Okay, so endo for endothermic process it will decrease the entropy of the surroundings. This is a correct statement. So C is the correct answer, okay. Uh, D, uh, we just debunked that statement. Most, uh, most sp spontaneous processes are endothermic, but not all endothermic processes are spontaneous. So uh, C is the correct answer. For the completeness of the discussion and for learning purpose, when you look at the same equation over here, all right, another factor, so one factor is the enthalpy uh, of the system, another factor is the temperature. So uh, for example, if I increase the temperature, because the temperature serves as the denominator in this equation, so the magnitude for the entropy change of the surrounding uh, will decrease mathematically. Uh, so if I increase the temperature, the entropy for the surrounding will decrease. Let's look at question number six. An exothermic reaction is a process that... So basically here, uh, we are trying to relate uh, first, in, first, what is an uh, exothermic reaction? For exothermic reaction, that means that delta S is going to be uh, smaller than zero. And sometimes we write... Uh, SYS to indicate specifically this is for delta H for the system, but you don't have to write uh, 
uh, delta H is cis, you can simply write delta H is smaller than zero. So it has a negative, so basically uh, it has a not positive, not positive, but negative, negative delta H. Okay, what about the delta S for surrounding? How do we relate delta S of the surrounding to the delta H? Okay, that's the equation. So we're going to write this thing again. All right, so delta S for the surrounding is the negative delta H for the system over T. So since it's exothermic reaction, which means in the circle this thing is smaller than zero, but you have a negative sign before it. So delta S for the surrounding will be greater than zero. That's why C is the correct answer. Let's look at question number seven. What's the sign of the, uh, so basically over here, <laughs> it should be the delta S universe, okay. Sorry about it. Yeah. So what is the sign of a delta S of a universe for a living biological system? Basically, uh, we need to understand one thing. For all biological, uh, living biological system, they are occurring naturally, which means this process is going to be spontaneous. All naturally occurring processes are spontaneous. Okay. So according to the second law, of thermodynamics which tells you for any spontaneous process the delta s for the universe is uh, greater than zero or the total total entropy for the universe will increase so that's why this is a uh, positive number eight which of the following relationships is correct at constant t and p okay remember Delta G is actually defined to be delta T times delta S for the universe. Okay, this is by definition, right? Delta S for the system, if you really want to emphasize. So the delta G also is equal to uh, delta H minus T times delta S. We do know delta G is the Gibbs free energy, and it's defined by these two equations, the first or second, they are equivalent. So A, delta G is proportional to delta T, uh, to the negative uh, delta S for the universe. That is correct, according to the first equation over here. All right, now you look at the second statement, delta G greater than zero represents an increase in kinetic energy. So this is not uh, kinetic energy over here. Uh, delta G is actually the Gibbs free energy. Okay, it has nothing to do with the kinetic energy. So this statement is wrong. Uh, C, delta G represents a spontaneous, uh, greater than zero. It represents actually a non-spontaneous process, right? Okay, delta G greater than zero, that means it's non-spontaneous. Delta G smaller than zero, that's spontaneous. So this tells us A is the, is the correct answer. Let's look at the next question. Consider a reaction that has a positive delta H and and the positive delta S. Which of the following statement is true? So uh, this is talking about two factors in control of the reaction or process spontaneity. Uh, let's make this table. Do remember when the delta H is smaller than zero, okay? Then this is favored in terms of a spontaneity. When delta S is greater than zero, then that this is favored for spontaneity. So if both, so let's uh, look at that. If it delta H, for example, if delta H is favored, that means smaller than zero, and uh, delta S is also favored. If both are favored, okay, then for sure the the spontaneity is going to be always spontaneous no matter what temperature it is right always spontaneous so we know this table but it's also uh, easy to understand because both factors the only two factors both of them are favoring spontaneity so it's always spontaneous all right so what if both is disfavored for example if it's an endothermic reaction like or delta h greater than zero and delta s is smaller than zero that means the only two factors, both of them are disfavored for spontaneity, 
So the reaction will be always non-spontaneous, no matter what temperature you have over here. Okay. Another fact, another thing is, if one is favorite, one is disfavored. For example, if delta H is greater than zero, that means it's endothermic. This is disfavoring the spontaneity. But at the same time, uh, delta S is favorite. So in another word, both are positive over here. One favorite, one disfavored. Okay. So in this process, when both are positive, both are positive, positive. In this case, it uh, the spontaneity depends on the temperature. When both are positive, then uh, it's only spontaneous at high temperatures. It's only spontaneous at high temperature. Uh, high temperature. Okay. So the opposite is also true. When delta H is favored or it's exothermic reaction and that delta S is disfavoring or entropy is decreasing, then uh, it also the spontaneity depends on the temperature. It's only spontaneous at uh, low temperature. And this is so-called high or low. It's a relative number okay, for that particular process. So for this reason, uh, in this process, it tells you you have a delta H that is positive. Remember, when I was writing this delta H uh, smaller than zero, that means it's a favor. Uh, this is for general learning process. In this particular question, it tells you you have a positive delta H. So that's a positive delta H and a positive delta S. So you're talking about this situation. Okay, so this is disfavor, this is favor. So the reaction will be spontaneous only at high temperature. That's why for question number nine, C is the correct answer. Now let's look at the question number 10. All right. This is a question of the same type. So when you are review on this type of question, focus on the topics. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. We are talking about two factors uh, governing the spontaneity of the reaction. For question number 10, you have delta H smaller than zero and the delta S uh, smaller than zero as well. So when you look at the top table we just talked about, because both are smaller than zero, it's the last situation over here. This means the reaction is only spontaneous at low temperature. But how do you find out the, at the, what is the turning temperature? So basically, uh, when delta, because delta G is delta H minus T times delta S, right? So when when this is zero, okay, when delta G is zero, that gives you the turning temperature, okay? Uh, that means below that temperature, the reaction will be spontaneous. So we need to calculate that. That means T is at delta H over delta S. So your delta H is going to be negative one three uh, zero six is kilojoule remember the unit is kilojoule and delta s has joule per k so when you need to calculate that you're going to convert this to, to joule so this is joule divided by negative one five three point two joule per k so joule is cancelled out so in this case that will give you the turning temperature it turns out c is the correct answer that gives you a six seven uh, six two okay but it's uh, below this uh, temperature okay so that's why C is the correct answer let's look at a question number 11 identify which of the statement is false the first statement entropy increases with dissolution when you dissolve something in water okay for example uh, uh, in NaCl, like it was solid phase, now it's dissolved in water, so it will become NaCl uh, aqueous. So apparently in the solid state, you have less freedom to move. And in the aqueous phase, it's more freedom to move. So the entropy will increase. That's a correct statement. But you try to identify which one is false. Okay, This one is correct, but you don't pick it because you pick the false statement. B for noble gases entropy increases with size. That is correct, okay? Uh, because, for example, uh, you have uh, entropy for helium, 
all right and the entropy for neon okay argon krypton xenon so uh, the entropy will increase from the top to bottom uh, when you look at the periodic table it sits uh, helium sits on the top and the xenon uh, xeno sits on the bottom okay but the size are all molar mass right remember there are some factors over there uh, governing the entropy so molar mass when molar mass increases okay entropy will also increases okay and uh, you also have some other factors uh, for this about the same molar mass so if the uh, molecular complexity increases then entropy will also increases so uh, the example you see over here for the molar mass increase will cause the entropy increase complexity increase let's give you an example for example uh, the nitrogen when you look at the molar mass is about 28 grams per mole okay uh, when you look at uh, c2 h4 the molar mass is also about 20 28 grams per mole so in terms of the molar mass uh, it's about the same but uh, a c2h4 has more atoms inside the molecule so for this reason the entropy of n2 is actually uh, smaller than that of uh, a c2h4 which is ethylene the reason is because c2h4 is more complex despite of the fact that both have about the same uh, same uh, molar mass okay so those are the two factors so let's look at question number 12 it's the uh, same type of question uh, look at the factors controlling the entropy magnitude place the following in the order of increase in entropy uh, that's exactly the same example we talked about over here so uh, it depends on you're looking at the molar mass over here okay because all of the molecules they are single atom so in terms of molecular complexity they are exactly the same okay so the correct answer for question number 12 it would be D okay which is exactly the same as what we talked about over here it depends on several factors you have a molar mass and uh, then you look at complexity so there are some other factors okay we discussed for example the phases uh, the entropy for gas phase is going to be greater than that of the liquid phase and greater than the solid phase and etc okay so we have more factors if you want to include that one it would be s for the gas is greater for s uh, for the liquid and greater for s for the solid so we put these things together in the same place so hopefully this can help you with your exam preparation now let's look at question number 13 place the following uh, in the order of a decrease in molar uh, entropy so it's the same uh, thing we are testing over here so we try to decide the factors controlling the entropy as we said we have a physical states right physical states okay so s gas i'm repeating okay but hopefully this is going to help it's going to be greater than s liquid it's going to be greater than s for the solid s is the entropy that's the first uh, factor you're talking about in the second one you have the molar mass okay factor the greater the molar mass the greater the entropy now the third one is the uh, molecular complexity molecular complexity for the molecules of about the same molar masses then uh, the more atoms you have inside that uh, uh, molecule uh, then the mo that molecule is more complex okay then that means the uh, entropy for that more complex molecule is expected to be higher okay so when you look at this series of molecules over here they all have they are all diatomic which means the molecular complexity is about the same okay so 
the physical state, all of them actually, they exist in gas phase. So uh, the first factor is also the same. And we're going to compare the molar mass. When molar mass increases, entropy will increase. We're going to put them in decreasing order. So chlorine is the largest. Okay, fluorine is the second, hydrogen is the lightest in molar mass. So for this reason, question number 13 would have, uh, when you look at decrease in entropy, B is the correct answer. So let's continue to question number 14. Uh, which one of the following has the highest standard molar entropy? Again, uh, this one is testing <coughs> Uh, the three factors we're talking about. The first is the physical state. The second one is actually the molar mass. The third one is the uh, complexity. When you look at all these formulas over here, apparently they uh, look very similar. It's just two things to get this x and y in the form. The formula it's like x and y, one to one ratio. So uh, you will look at the molar mass because the molecular complexity is the same and they all exist in the same physical state. So you're going to, uh, which one has the highest standard molar entropy? You would expect the one that has the largest, uh, largest molar mass to be the correct answer. So for this reason, question number 14, the largest one is D because the molar mass, uh, this one has the largest molar mass, iodine is the largest and sodium is the same for all four answers over there okay so that's why 14d is the correct answer now let's look at question number 15 how do you calculate the delta s for the re reaction given the s so basically uh, for delta s for the reaction since entropy is a state function so the change for the entropy for the reaction would be the total entropy for the products, right? MP means chemical coefficient. For example, this the, uh, like one, one, two, one here. That's the uh, that's the MP. Uh, that's the N. Okay, MP that means it's the re re chemical coefficient for the product. And here they are so-called NR. That means it's the chemical coefficient for the reactants. The R represent sub subscript R represent the uh, reactants. So MP means the chemical coefficient for the product times the corresponding entropy right, for products minus the total or sigma that means NR means the chemical coefficient for the reactants times the entropy for the reactants. So when you put it together do remember don't forget to multiply this uh, chemical coefficient. In this case, it's the most simple case. Everything is one over there. But if you have a two or three, you must use that. Okay. So for this reason, this is the product. So it's a one times uh, two one nine point three. Okay. Now minus the total of the reactants. So it would be. So here it's the one over here. All right. It's one times two hundred point nine. All right. Plus, now it's also 1 times for hydrogen, it's 1 times 130.7. Right, so you put this together, question number 15, you do the calculation, it will give you B is the correct answer. As I just emphasized, if the chemical coefficients, if, if here, if they are not 1 over here, you will have to change to the correct one. Okay, here, in this case, it's the most simple one. You do have a number one over there, which is okay. Uh, look at question number 16. Which of the following compounds have the highest delta GF? So what is delta GF? Delta GF is so-called uh, Gibbs free energy of formation. Okay, Gibbs free energy of formation. So what do you mean? Well, we have actually learned this uh, similar things in Jenkins 1, okay? Uh, when we do that in Jenkins 1, we have learned the delta H, delta H not for stable elements. Remember, it's for elements only, not compounds, okay, uh, is zero, okay. 
the delta H or delta HF. Okay. So for example, uh, the delta H for oxygen, delta H not. This not means a standard condition. Okay. So delta H not for nitrogen. Oh, this will be zero. What about for oxygen? Delta H. Yeah, this will be zero because they are what? They are elements, most stable elements. Okay. Uh, this in this chapter we actually talked about something that is similar, which is a delta G or delta G F. Okay, for most stable elements will also be zero. So uh, if you write delta G naught for nitrogen, yes, it will be zero. Delta G naught for oxygen, yes, it will be zero as well. Okay, so all of this, the elements, elements, most stable elements, so for this reason, delta G, F, all of this, delta G for this guy will be zero, delta G will be zero, and delta G not will be zero, delta G not is zero for all A, B, C, and D. So that's why E is the correct answer in this case. Question number 17. Which of the react uh, uh, given the chemical reaction over here, and we tell you the delta G, we want you uh, to calculate the delta G for the following reaction. To remember delta G, this is a state function. Okay. So we have learned this in actual Jenkins 1. In Jenkins 1, we know for state functions, uh, when you reverse the reaction, the reaction, uh, so when you, this reaction, when you look at that, you have 3NO, here you have 3NO, so you have uh, NO, N2O, N2O, NO2, NO2, apparently uh, the reaction number one and the reaction number two, they are reverse reactions. So for the new reaction, the G, delta G for the reaction, if you reverse the reaction, you will have a negative sign before it. It will be delta negative the original amount. Okay, so for this reason, question number 17, you will have C as the correct answer. Okay, all right. Uh, let's review uh, a couple more examples. Okay, so what if you multiply the first equation? Okay, this has been done in Jenkins 1, but we're going to review. For example, I'm going to multiply a certain number. So you have a reaction over here. So I'm going to multiply, for example, twice. So if this whole thing multiplied by 2, what's going to happen? So if you multiply by 2, the reaction will become, for example, you have, you have, you have twice as much of everything. So the reaction will become... Uh, this will become 6 and no. So what will be the delta G for this new reaction? Okay, this delta G it will be because everything is actually twice as much as the original. As a state function, the more amount you, uh, of material you have, then the greater the amount will be, right? And uh, how many times of the original you will have? It would be two times. So this would be twice as much of the original. So original over here, that's what you see over here. 23 so this would give you a negative 46.0 okay so if this is a different question that is being asked question number 18 calculate the delta G for the reaction okay how do you calculate the delta G for the reaction uh, remember we learned something like this right in Jenkins 1 which is delta H and delta H for the reaction for any state function actually share similar uh, calculation because the H is state function, the S is also a state function, the G is also a state function. So for the reaction, before and after the reaction, before the reaction you have the reactants, before, after the reaction you have the products, right? So the change for the enthalpy for the reaction would be the total entropy for the products because product is the final state it's always final minus initial okay so to the H for the products 
minus the total of those of the reactants. Again, NP means it's the chemical coefficient for the products. NR means the chemical coefficient for the reactants, like the numbers before the substances. Okay, so the product are minus that of the reactants. So you'll notice for any state function, we just learned the new one, delta S, uh, in this chapter. So they share almost the exact the same okay, format, which is final minus initial. A final is going to be the products, because that's the end state. And uh, the initial is going to be the starting material. Oh, this is not. This is actually S over here. For the reactants. Okay, so this question is, is uh, the last situation. It's the delta G. For the products. And minus that of the reactants. Whoops. So which one are we going to use? Okay, are we going to use the, the last one as we just mentioned? Yes, you can, uh, but it's not as convenient because when you look at question itself, okay, basically when you look at question, we are given the delta H and the S. So uh, we can calculate the delta H and delta S first. So we're going to use this first, then we can do the delta G by definition. This will be uh, delta H minus T times delta S. That's how you do, you do the calculation. So this is analysis. Let's work on this. So uh, when you, you can do the delta H calculation, delta H for the reaction, this will be, so you do the calculation, it's going to be the total for the products minus the total of the reactants. So uh, remember, zero is not given, but you must know, because this guy is an element, as we just learned, the delta H for an element will be zero over here. That's why we put it zero there, but it's not provided, but you should know. So it will be the total for the uh, products. So seven times zero, it would be zero. Uh, plus it will be 12 times 12 times a uh, negative 285 okay point eight minus the total for the reactants over here so the reactants we have a four here so it's four times negative 133.9 uh, plus you have five times, you don't forget the five, five times 50.6, right? So this gives us a number. I'm going to use a calculator to calculate this. The answer is negative 314.7. Uh, do pay attention to the units, okay? So it's gonna be a, a kilojoule as the unit, All right? Now let's do, uh, Delta S over here, to S for the reaction. So that's the products. It's seven times 191.6 plus 12 times 70.0. That's the total of the products minus the total of the reactants. It will be a four times 266, 266.9 plus uh, five times uh, 121.2. Let's do a calculation over here. So this gives us an answer, uh, 507.6. Do pay attention to the units over here. That's joule per k. Uh, why, why the mole is missing? Because this 12 means it's actually 12 mole. Okay, so a four means a four mole. So mole is actually canceled out already. So that's why uh, you do not see this, not the mole, because mole 
is multiplied by the number of moles of the chemical coefficient. All right. So now let's put it together because delta G uh, for the reaction will be delta H uh, minus T delta S. Okay. So this is kilojoule. You got to uh, multiply a thousand, so we can convert it to joule. Okay. So minus what? What, what is T? It tells you it's the standard condition. Okay. So that means it's twenty-five degrees C. But you're not going to use twenty-five because you're going to use kilojoule. Uh, uh, you're going to use a Kelvin. So this will be the same as uh, two seventy-three. Okay. So you use 273 or 273.15. The final answer might be slightly different, but you should be able to uh, get the correct answer that way. So you do the calculation. That will be a 298. Because 273, I'm mean, sorry, 273 plus 25, okay, that gives you 298, okay, times 507.06. Point zero six. So let's calculate this final answer. So all right, let's uh, when I redid the calculation. Actually, this turns out to be three one four seven, not point seven. Okay, three one four seven. So this will give us 3.30, next to 3.30, times 10 raised to uh, fourth kilojoule. Okay, so uh, the correct answer actually, we should change this to uh, 10 raised to four in the answer. In this way, we will have E as the correct answer, or else there will be no correct answer here. So when you do your calculation, Please remember, uh, the units are really important over here. It's kilojoule, so you must convert it to joule by multiplying 1000 for the delta H. That's one of the most common mistakes you're running to. So by the way, as I said, uh, sorry, uh, here you do not see a correct answer unless you change all the answers to uh, 10 raised to fourth power rather than three okay all right okay let's go to uh next question question number 19 calculate the delta g for the reaction given under 298 k under the condition conditions shown below apparently when you look at uh, you are given you're given a chemical reaction and a delta g not delta g under standard condition but in this case for standard condition it will be every partial pressure should be 1 atm. So apparently, in this case, delta G is not under standard condition. So what are we testing over here? We're testing how to calculate delta G okay, under non-standard condition. Delta G is delta G naught plus R times T natural log of Q. So you need to be able to uh, calculate the Q. How do you calculate the Q? This uh, Q is going to be a solid will not be included in any equilibrium constant or reaction quotient related calculation. So Q will be 1 over P O2, uh, PHG squared, you see the 2 over here, times P for the O2. So this will be 1 over 0 0.025 squared times uh, 0 0.037. So let me do a calculation. So Q equals 4, 3, Two, four, three. The next step, delta G will be delta G naught. Remember, delta G naught has a kilojoule as a unit. 
So that's some of the things you need to pay attention to for the calculations in this particular uh, chapter. Pay attention to the unit. It's kilojoule here, so it must be multiplied by 1,000 times. This will convert to joule. Because when you use the R over there, R is in joule per mole per K. Okay. So when you do that, it's 8.31 that you're going to use, not 0 0.083. Okay. So the uh, when you do this calculation, the temperature is 298 and the natural log of 4323. Okay. So after you do this calculation, then for question number 19, D will be the correct answer. So this gives us Remember, this is joule. When you convert it to kilojoule, so it will be next to 154.4 kilojoule. Question number 20 is quite straightforward. Uh, delta G, if delta G is greater than zero, the reaction is non-spontaneous. So this is a wrong answer, but it's we are picking the which one is not true, so D is the correct answer. Let's look at question number 21. Which of the following reaction will have the largest equipping constant? You don't actually do the calculation, right? So basically when you look at this equation, delta G naught is uh, negative times RT log K. So you will know the larger the delta G, the smaller the K, the, or the more positive that a G is, then uh, the smaller K is, okay? Then the more negative that a G is, then the larger the K is. So, so basically, uh, larger that a G, or more specifically, the more positive, the more positive uh, delta G is will lead to smaller K, right? Smaller delta G, or it might be easier for you to understand, or more negative delta G is, this will give you a larger K. So in this case, we're trying to uh, pick the largest equipping constant. That means the most negative uh, delta G. There is no need to do calculation. So for question number 21, correct answer is the most negative one, which is B as the correct answer. Uh, number 22. So use the Gibbs free energy formation below to calculate the equipping constant. So basically, uh, uh, we are given delta GF for each and every substance over here. So first thing you need to use that delta G for the reaction. Okay. Uh, so you basically do the calculation for the MP. Then uh, you have the delta GF for the product uh, for the products minus the total for that of the reactants. So you substitute numbers in. I'm not going to do that this time. Okay. Then you do this calculation. Then you need to calculate the equipping constant. So you do know that a G is related to a equipping constant uh, in this equation. So K will be E times negative delta G naught over RT. Okay. So you substitute the two numbers in, uh, uh, delta G will be calculated from over here. All right. And do remember, uh, you need to convert delta G into joule per K. It will be initially a uh, kilojoule, as you see over here. Okay. So this will be kilojoule. You're going to multiply 1,000, so it will become joule. Okay. I mean a kilojoule. So you put the numbers over there. 
and will give you uh, the correct answer. Okay, so number 22, the correct answer is D. Look at question number 23. Uh, what, uh, what element? I was going to say. So determine the equilibrium constant of the following uh, reaction. So basically, uh, you're given delta H and the delta S. So similarly, this is a relationship of delta G and the K. All right. So, but you need to calculate delta G first by using uh, this equation. T times that. So substitute the numbers in over here. But when you do the substitution, though, do remember that H has kilojoule. You will need to uh, multiply 1,000. So, okay, this becomes joule. Minus T is going to be in Kelvin is 298K times, don't forget the negative sign over here. It's negative 414.2 sure okay so you do this calculation first then similarly because for delta g these two equations as you see over here they are equivalent right i always write both just for teaching purpose uh, what you need is actually the second one only which is uh, e uh, k equals e raised to a uh, negative delta g over rt okay so here this will give you a joule already so substitute that number uh, this calculation in you will be able to get your correct answer question number 23 C is the correct answer now uh, let's do uh, question number 24 number 24 belongs to chapter 18 uh, electrochemistry so what is reduction basically when you do the review you got to know uh, what is reduction Reduction, that means uh, oxidation state, oxidation state, or OS, all right, will decrease in that process. Okay. For oxidation, oxidation state will increase. All right. So another related concept is uh, a reductant. So reductant is the species that is oxidized reductants uh, a reductant is oxidized or in the reductant you will see oxidation state increase it's kind of confusing isn't it yeah i'm gonna say it for one more time a reductant is being reduced uh, uh, sorry a reductant is being oxidized so inside that reductant inside that reductant you will see oxidation state increase okay because reductant is oxidized and oxidant because oxidant is a substance okay oxidant is a substance reduction and oxidation they are processes okay so an oxidant is actually reduced so what do you mean it's being reduced that means an oxidant inside the oxidant you will see the oxidation state uh, decrease okay so that species will be called oxidant the other one will be a reductant so let's do this in the question number 24 first you should be able to correctly assign the oxidation state which you have learned in general chemistry uh, uh, general chemistry one so this is negative two so this will be a plus seven oxidation state so this is a negative two and then this is a positive one so when you do the calculation you would uh, be able to come up with this is a plus three okay so this is plus two and this is negative two this is plus four so when you look at oxidation state all right uh, we do see for manganese it changes from seven to two so the oxidation state decreases. so this process is called a reduction because it changed from okay and what is being reduced it's the MN that is being reduced so the correct answer is C but what is being oxidized so from carbon is oxidized because carbon changes from uh, plus 3 to plus 4 
So this one would be oxidized or ox this is process is oxidation. Okay. So in another word, manganese in MnO4 minus or per manganate ion, uh, this one is being reduced. So for this reason, this is being reduced. This is reduced. Remember what is being reduced? What is being reduced? The oxidant. So that one serves as the oxidant. So if we ask which of the following is the oxidant, it will be uh, MnO4 minus or permanganate. Right. Okay. Similarly, uh, carbon inside this compound is actually being oxidized. So this is oxidized. So that reagent is actually what is being oxidized? It's a reductant. So hopefully this example helps you understand the four different concepts: reduction, oxidation, reductant and oxidant. So let's do one more uh, example. First, you've got to be able to assign the correct uh, oxidation state. So this is a plus one, negative two. So this would be a plus three. Or you can simply say OH, the whole thing carries a negative one. Okay, that will also work. So this whole thing is actually a negative one. So you'll be able to assign the oxidation state for chromium more easily. This is negative two, and this is plus one. So this is negative two. This would be a plus uh, six. So this is negative one. So you look at oxidation state change. Chromium, did you see that? This undergoes increase. So this is oxidation. That means for question number 25, D is the correct answer, okay? Uh, similarly, uh, when you look at the chlorine here, it actually undergoes reduction for that process because the oxidation state changes from uh, positive 1 to negative 1, okay, because this is negative 1 as we assigned already. Let's look at uh, question number 26. So uh, what is a voltaic cell? A voltaic cell, when you look at that, what is a voltaic cell? Voltaic cell uh, is just a, what we use in the battery, okay? Or oh, this is the same as battery. That's what a voltaic cell. So basically, this whole process is spontaneous. Okay, so for this reason, uh, A is the correct answer. It produces electrical current from uh, spontaneous chemical reaction. All right. For an electrolytic cell, it's the opposite. An electrolytic cell requires the input of electrical energy to make that non-spontaneous process to happen. So a voltaic cell is totally opposite uh, to an electrolytic cell. Right. Let's look at uh, question number 27. Identify the location of uh, the oxidation. Do remember one thing, inox and uh, red cat. So for this reason, question number 7, D is the correct answer. That's where oxidation happens. Question number 28. What is a salt bridge? Uh, when you're done reading the question, basically uh, A is the correct answer, not too much uh, ex explanation is needed, a pathway by which count ions can flow. So a salt bridge actually balance the charges as well. Not only it complete the circuit, it also balance the charges. Okay. Question number 29. We'll continue with the second half of this review. Uh, because it's already midnight when I'm recording this. Because we have uh, simply too many practice, practice exam questions over here.